DSL has continued to grow at a very steady rate, maybe an additional 30 to 40 million new subscribers every year. That's the totality of DSL, including the old ADSLs, the new VDSLs, the new vectored uh, VDSLs, and that trend has been very consistent uh, for more than uh, a decade now. There's about 500 million paying uh, DSL subscribers um, around the, the world. Uh, it's about 200 billion a year in service uh, revenues, and that will continue uh, to grow by all of the projections uh, that we see. To be a little cautious, sometimes you'll see fiber growing, DSL not growing. People are, 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 it's how they're interpreting the numbers. They're not including fiber to the node with VDSL or fiber to the basement with Ethernet, which actually is a VDSL also. Most people don't realize that. If you include all the DSLs together, and we do because that's our market for our, our company, it is 500 million and that's still growing at a healthy pace. I think the, the application, and not in the form that everyone says, it's not so much the service provider's video, but the over-the-top video to the tablets and the smartphones, the, the YouTubes, the uh, Netflixes and Hulus and so forth. Um, that segment of the market, particularly with younger people, is growing and driving up a bandwidth need on the internet a portion of the uh, access network. So if it's a cable or a fiber, it's not the 100 channels of video. You're talking about it's the internet portion, but that's where the, the new, uh, the new uh, users, uh, if you are new consumers, are uh, running up the bandwidth needs very rapidly. Almost all of those to date, other than about, uh, well, in terms of vectored media, so almost none of the, uh, the lines today are vectored. So they all could be upgraded at least a factor of two or three. That may require moving fiber closer to the customer, not all the way, so you get within or the fiber penetrates the network far enough so that it, it's still maybe a kilometer, uh, 3,000 feet, to the consumer on the uh, copper DSL that, that's ending uh, that wired uh, connection. But um, all of them could increase uh, if some fiber is used as well. Well, DSL is a little less than half the fixed line connections in the United States, which is unique to the United States. We have. Uh, have long had a uh, broadcast cable uh, plant in the United States, so you see more cable modem uh, usage uh, here. But uh, definitely there are tens of millions of, uh, of DSLs in the United States. We happen to manage uh, more than 90% of those at, at OSIA, so we're very much aware of that. See the speeds going up, um, increasing use of VDSL uh, throughout all of the networks um, uh, in particular, and uh, a strong interest in vectored VDSL to get to 50 to 100 megabit individual connections. Uh, so the future is bright here in that sense. Um, very interesting in that case is an individual connection uh, of 50 to 100 megabits per second. That blows away cable and fiber because those are shared networks. And one of the mistakes that they made in the shared networks is they didn't anticipate the over-the-top video. And so they, they, they didn't allocate enough to the Internet bandwidth. All of that is broadcast video uh, bandwidth there. So the, the uh, DSL connections are going to come out with a lot more internet over the top capability than you're going to see on the uh, on the shared uh, multi-tapped connections like cable modem or uh, passive optical network uh, GPON, if you will. Europe, the uh, Germans, uh, Deutsche Telekom, so the Belgians, uh, some other uh, northern European uh, groups are are pressing ahead with plans to increase their VDSL footprint, in particular to add vectoring um, to their capabilities. The German program promises to offer 20 million uh, vectored VDSL systems running 50 to 100 megabits per second over the next several years uh, in terms of at least their deployment plans and they, they continue to move ahead with that program. Well, I, th I believe the report from the government has now uh, been concluded and the, the uh, it is open now on the use of fiber to the node. The previous government had uh, prohibited anything but a single source of fiber uh, to the home. Um, that was proving to be too expensive for the Australian consumers to afford, uh, with prices eventually rising to $200 to $300 per customer uh, under that program in order to finance it. So they have backed away from that and now allowing a number of competing alternatives. Uh, vectored VDSL, VDSL are very much at the top of the list because they are lower cost and would not lead to these high prices to the Australian uh, consumers. So 
Uh, that has all transpired over the last six months or so in Australia, and definitely high-speed uh, VDSLs are very much of interest there. Well, we, we, we manage a lot of those networks, and we're trying to get maybe a few megabits per second up to 10 megabits per second, or 10 megabits maybe up to 15 or 20 megabits per second. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done incrementally, and as they reach those levels, then it's conceivable that the service providers may be willing to invest the extra few hundred dollars per, per consumer to get fiber closer and then head the same way that you see in, in the more developed nations who are already attempting to make those types of investments. Well, the, the key uh, innovation, we have the basic patents on vectoring, we've licensed them pretty uh, widely uh, in the field, is there is an interference between the the twisted pair is called crosstalk, and that is largely eliminated um, through some signal processing and some complicated math behind it. But the net effect is when you eliminate that noise, there's a possibility to run two to three times faster on a twisted pair than what was possible uh, previous to that. Um, there's, uh, it actually also creates more issues. As you start to run faster, the system becomes more sensitive, which is an opportunity. Uh, for our company, actually, because we handle the sensitivity with our software management systems. Well, there are all kinds of issues of interoperability anytime you introduce a new technology, so that certainly is going to play out like ADSL and VDSL did in the, in the past. Um, the, the size of the node, in, in our opinion at ASIA, is far less important uh, than the actual management of the transition. Not everybody is going to be able to switch to vectoring at the same time. It's just not technically feasible. And it eliminates one of the economic advantages of DSL, which always has been incremental deployment. Fortunately, you don't need to do that. You can manage it, add the, the consumers one by one as they need or are willing to pay for the, uh, the capability, uh, do that in prudent ways, project how to do it, and that's what, that's our specialty in, in getting there. So that is far more critical to the actual you know, consumer content with those services than how big your node is uh, in terms of how many lines you can, cry, you can cancel across top. Yes, the speed of DSLs uh, or speeds on copper digital transmission are dependent on the length, one kilometer, 100 megabits is pretty much the limit. If you get down to a few hundred uh, meters, so less than a kilometer, you can get up to a few hundred megabits per second, okay, and, and uh, even a gigabit uh, per second is possible if the connection is short enough. The one thing that vectoring ignores is the customer premises noises. Those are not canceled, and they have been, for the longest time, the bugaboo of all DSL. Uh, as you eliminate the crosstalk, you see even more of those because they remain. And that has to be dealt with in order for DSL to be successful in the long run. And we have the solution uh, to that particular problem now at, uh, at OSI. You'll see more about that. So we hadn't, uh, we've been carefully kind of alpha testing it. You'll see release on that uh, later. But we're pretty proud of what we have for it. G dot fast. Uh, my, I have this thing that I joke about. I call Chaffee's 14-year rule. And having worked in the industry for over 30 years now, uh, the Belcor people, Joe Lechleiter, my friend, introduced ADSL back in 1987 to the standards committee, and by 2001, it had become deployed at about a million lines or more. It grew rapidly after that. Uh, VDSL, I know, I introduced in 1994. By 2008. 14 years later, uh, it had reached a million lines uh, of deployment. Vectoring, I know I introduced it in 2001. 2015, we may get that million lines. That's going to be close. Um, I, I was not involved in the introduction of GDOT FAST, but I know that it was 2009. So that would mean 2023. Now, some of my friends in the industry hope that that's not the case, but uh, it has been pretty consistent over the years that the, uh, the industry, it's difficult to move to new technologies. G.FAST also requires fiber go closer to the consumer, so it gets to be more than a few hundred dollars uh, per consumer in terms of that fiber deployment cost. So you start to raise the question about the economics of is there another alternative uh, uh, to that, either running the fiber all the way or using combinations of wireless uh, 
uh, capabilities to enhance the amount of speed that you can get to the uh, consumers who are demanding that. What the vectoring technologies, what the management technologies, the new technology and DSLs generally try to do is to make that as good a quality as possible over the longest range of copper that we can actually achieve the desired speed, like 100 megabits or something, because the shorter the fiber is, uh, the less it costs because it's going to be shared over a larger number of consumers. So if you're sharing it over thousands and thousands of consumers and it costs you a million dollars to run that fiber under the streets and down the streets and so forth, that's probably okay. Okay, it's right on the edge of being okay. If it's a few thousand, you're probably okay. Uh, but if it costs you that much to run it for just a hundred customers, it's probably at ten thousand dollars a customer, it's too much. Uh, we had the basic patents on that, introduced them uh, many years ago, I think it was 2004, 2005. Um, it is possible with four twisted pairs at about 300 meters to get a gigabit uh, service. Um, it's more expensive because there are multiple transceivers. There's actually seven of them, even though there's only four twisted pairs. If you think about it, there's eight wires in there, and uh, if you think about it for a while, you can see the seven channels. Uh, that's what phantom mode is. and it. Uh, while it's more expensive um, uh, in terms of the transceiver technologies and the speeds are quite high, I expected small business opportunities where they can't get a fiber into the building and may have multiple twisted pairs, that that will be the opportunity for phantom uh, DSLs in the future. We are entering a phase where we're not so much a startup any longer. The company is starting to become operationally cash flow positive, such a growing uh, to a fairly large revenue stream and uh, larger numbers of employees. So we can hope to continue that, that growth. Uh, I can't, uh, uh, past a certain point, I can't really comment on, on plans, but most companies, uh, of course, uh, past a certain point in time, uh, eventually hope to see some kind of uh, public exit. Uh, but we can't really talk about that when we, we get within a range of those types of things.